All right, well, thanks. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm here to talk about the work we're doing at 3IE, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation to embed transparency, reproducibility, and ethics into risk monitoring and mitigation of our research activities. I think it's worth mentioning that uh, the work is inspired by the first lesson I learned actually with the BITS community. Scott Desposado presented at the 2015 uh, BITS Summer Institute. And in his presentation, his key message was, we shouldn't be outsourcing our ethical judgments to IRBs. So I really took that to heart and I think a lot of others have as well. So hopefully uh, this work is reflective of some good work that BITS has been kind of pushing forward uh, for many years now. So for this presentation, I will cover the why we established a tree review framework in tree or in, in 3IE, what the proposed framework is, and what we've learned so far from incorporating tree into our research practice. Our hope is we can not only improve this process internally for 3IE, but also help other research organizations who may be tackling some of the same issues. I do hope that I have some time for Q&A at the end, but uh, this is a 40 minute presentation. I'm trying to sneak into 23 minutes. So I'm gonna try and stick to my script. So forgive me for that. So why are we talking about incorporating tree review into 3IE's research practices? I think that like many research organizations working in international development, at 3IE, we want to resource credible, unbiased evidence production that is meaningful for decision makers and is conducted in an ethical manner. Now, there are a variety of risks that face us in achieving that goal. First, I think anyone in the BITS community is already well aware of threats to the credibility of research. We've seen the results of publication bias, failures to replicate, and we've recognized the need for improvements in our own practices to mitigate actions such as p-hacking, selective reporting, and a lack of data and code sharing. Second, there are threats for the usability of evidence. So there are many potential constraints facing decision makers to use evidence in their decision making, but front and center is that the right evidence isn't always available at the right time. So ultimately the timeliness, the quality, and the relevance of the evidence could prevent usability. Lastly, we need to consider and assess the threats to participants of the research activities we lead. We know that some interventions may pose the potential for harm to individuals or households or businesses who are directly and indirectly affected by the interventions we're studying. We also know that engagement with human subjects as a part of our study methods introduces new potential for harm to participants. Potential for harm can include anything from feelings of re-traumatization or exploitation to having to participate in very long, lengthy surveys where we're collecting PII and sensitive data. And sometimes there's a real risk of harm if there's unauthorized disclosure of that data. Thankfully, through the good work of the research community and research funders and organizations like BITS and the Center for Open Science, we have many responses to mitigate these risks that we can incorporate into our practice. First, I think we all know there are lots of practices in transparency and reproducibility that improve the credibility of research. Second, there are practices that we can incorporate into our work that improve the usability of the evidence we produce. This includes engagement with relevant stakeholders to align our methods and research questions with demand for evidence. This also can be supported by evidence gap maps to identify where our evidence, evidence production can have the biggest impact. We can also use reporting standards and more transparency in individual studies to contribute to evidence synthesis products like systematic reviews and meta-analysis. These can be much more meaningful for some decision makers than just an individual uh, study. And lastly, there are principles and practices in place to support ethical conduct of research. As researchers, we must abide by a common set of ethical principles, so respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. These guide how we navigate ethical issues and minimize harm while maximizing the benefit of the research activities we lead. We also must go through IRB review to examine the decisions we make on study design and implementation that may affect the human subjects we directly or indirectly engage with. And there have been an increasing number of calls for us to be more transparent and more documented in the ethical decision-making we make during our research. So we have a set of strong practices that we can put in place to mitigate these risks but at 3IE, at least, we've recognized three remaining challenges. So within 3IE, we established a research transparency policy in 2018 
which actually was a result of a BITS grant, I think back in 2018, that defined and prioritized many of the best practices and responses to these risks. We updated that policy in 2021, but we found that a top-down policy that defines what we should do is only one step and it's not sufficient. Really, we have found that research teams, whether internal to 3IE or 3IE research grantees, need more support on how to implement and balance these responses within their already challenging work programs and to make sure these responses are built into budgeting and design stage planning. The second challenge is that when it comes to research ethics, we don't really share a common language on ethical best practices and standards. We do share a common language around the ethical principles, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. But when it comes to more granular and actionable ethical best practices, we're sometimes saying the same things in the same way, in different ways, and sometimes talking about different things. To highlight this point, there are three papers that came out in early 2021 that called on our community to be more transparent, be more reflective, and be more careful in our thinking around ethical issues in our research. And even though all three were considering the same issue, how, to, how do we ensure more ethical conduct of our research, they were also approaching the questions and responses in slightly different ways and calling attention to slightly different ethical topics. We think this really points to a need for our community to establish common language and standards around more granular, actionable ethical practices. Challenge three, the last challenge is we often outsource ethics reviews to IRBs, just going back to Scott Desposado's first point. And while IRBs play a very important role, just relying on IRB review can leave gaps for ethical review. First, we often have very complex research teams with co-PIs and PIs based in a variety of institutions. And so sometimes we may need to go through multiple IRBs. It's not clear which ones to go through. It's not clear which ones set precedent. Second, it, depending on the research type and purpose, an IRB may determine the study is exempt from review, even when we're directly engaging with human subjects, collecting PII and collecting sensitive data. Third, when we work with high income country based IRBs, we don't always have the representation of the local communities we're working with. And when we work with local IRBs, they're not always well resourced to handle the, the workload that comes through them. Fourth, IRBs are not yet, or at least consistently reviewing research protocols for best practices in transparency and reproducibility. So in an IRB review, we aren't getting a full review of all the practices we're putting in place for the ethical conduct of our research. And lastly, uh, the IRB process is just not very transparent. So at 3IE, we wanted to complement our existing tree policy and address these three challenges with an additional response that aims to examine, monitor, mitigate risks through the intersecting lens of transparency, reproducibility, and ethics. So why this intersecting lens? Uh, we have three pillars, transparency, reproducibility, and ethics, and sometimes these seem to sit in silos within conversations in the community and within organizations themselves. And I don't really think we mean for that to happen because transparency and reproducibility are really efforts for more ethical conduct of research. Now, if they remain in silos and only some groups are talking about transparency while others are talking about ethics, it can create a challenge when there are tensions between these pillars. For example, it's sometimes not possible or ethical to be fully transparent and reproducible if we can't de-identify the data that underlies the analysis. And, and do so in a way that ensures we're adhering to our promises of confidentiality. And when we think about transparency and reproducibility separate from ethical conduct of research, we can limit the benefits of how these pillars really complement each other. For example, more transparency can allow us to examine and document power dynamics and conflicts of interest than research teams and research funders, which again support more ethical conduct of research. Ultimately, there's a common thread across all the risk mitigation responses discussed above and tree, and that's to think early, think often, and document, document, document. We can't be transparent if we're not documenting first. And we know we're not alone in thinking about these issues. In 2021, 3IE sent out a questionnaire regarding interest in topics around transparency, reproducibility, and ethics. Out of 65 respondents who chose to participate in this study, more than half have concerns regarding ethical data practices, and a, between 35 and 45% had concerns regarding the interventions we study, 
the research methods we use, and engagement with human subjects. 55% of the respondents indicated they'd be very interested to learn more about a tree review process. And so we want to respond to this need, not just within 3IE and for our 3IE research teams, but within the community for those organizations who may be interested. So what is the proposed tree review framework? Big picture is we first wanna make sure we're asking the right questions at the right time of the research teams. How are they navigating certain ethical issues? We want this to be a supportive peer review function and not seen as a policing or an auditing function, which is sometimes a little difficult balance to, to, to make. Um, we do intend to establish this for internal 3IE research teams, and we do intend for this to be a supportive function for 3IE grantees, uh, and it potentially could be a, a service that we offer to other organizations looking to tackle similar issues. So what have we done to develop the tree framework? First, we're leaning on work being done to interpret and define ethical requirements for social science and public policy research that extend from the clinical research literature. I would point everyone to the Oxford Handbook of Research Ethics, as well as several other papers by Dr. Douglas McKay. There's a series of papers looking at themes like standard of care, maximizing the social value of research, fair methods and fair randomization, the list goes on and on. And really this literature provides a useful foundation for establishing common language around those ethical practices. In addition to this literature, we think we can also look to how clinical research teams establish risk monitoring committees. These are often independent review mechanisms that complement and support the work of IRBs and can provide more timely actionable review to research teams as they implement research projects and navigate ethical issues in real time. Ultimately, we don't want to just outsource our ethical judgments. We want to establish a stronger internal risk monitoring system that leverages the intersecting lens of transparency, reproducibility, and ethics. So the goal remains the same. We want to resource research practices that produce credible, unbiased, meaningful evidence in an ethical manner. The objective of the tree review process is to establish a common language regarding ethical requirements, better integrate best practices for tree into research workflow, and establish timely, continuous, independent review of risks facing the research team to meet our goal. So to do this, we first developed the tree review questionnaire. This is where we defined 10 ethical requirements in a tool that the research team can use to document the practices and decisions they're making to align with those ethical requirements. Second, the research team can use that questionnaire to document their responses and as a means for linking to any other relevant internal and external documentation. Basically, even without a review, the documentation can be useful for the research team. Third, within 3IE, we do have an independent tree team, and that team conducts an independent review of the research team's responses to the tree review questionnaire. Fourth, the tree review questionnaire can be a living document for the research team to maintain over the course of the research project, and that can help inform a final ethics appendix, as is called for in the Asedu Carlin et al. paper. So now for the, the heart of, of the questionnaire. So the 10 ethical requirements that we're putting forth now, and, and certainly this is the first time we're kind of presenting this and opening ourselves up to the community to get kind of feedback on this as well. Um, the first requirement is to use transparency as a tool. So this is where we request the research team to document their assessments of conflicts of interest, the extent to which staff and consultants are trained on protection of human subjects, their use of pre-specification and standardized reporting materials, how they have navigated the IRB review requirements, their practices to ensure responsible data management, an internal and external reproducible workflow to the extent possible. We also conduct an internal push button replication exercise before any final paper submission. The last point is that we ask in this section to complete a transparency checklist so that the team is clear on what will be published and what won't and why, at least be transparent about what we can't be transparent about. The second requirement is to ensure the team is maximizing social value and meaningful use. This includes the research team's assessment of the problem diagnostic that the intervention or policy that they're studying is trying to address. It includes documenting the motivation for conducting the research and who the potential evidence consumers will be 
as well an assessment of any incentives that may be in place by various stakeholders to potentially misuse the research findings. The third requirement is to balance power and align incentives, which is not very easy to do, but attempting to do so with at least first documenting these things. So this requires the team to examine potential power dynamics and the relationship across research funders, implementing partners, research participants, and the research team themselves. Also examine research participants' vulnerabilities, the research team's role in the intervention, and any potential restrictions that have been placed upon the research team to report out on final analysis. The fourth requirement is to assess the extent to which the intervention studied will preserve or improve the de facto standard of care, to consider if the intervention or study requires deceit, and to provide an assessment and explanation on the legality of the intervention and the study methods used. The fifth requirement is to value and prioritize how the study team engages with the community. This includes ensuring research participant representation at study design and implementation and dissemination, and special emphasis on research participant feedback loop to ensure the study team is providing research participants with information regarding the learning and evidence that's generated as a result of their valuable input. Uh, the Bufsara Center actually just published a really interesting blog on that, their work around that last week or the week before, and I can share that if you haven't seen that yet. The sixth requirement is to use fair methods. This recognizes that we don't always use randomization, although there's a lot of papers out there that focus on these issues for RCTs, but that we don't always use randomization as an identification strategy. And what we care about is the use of fair methods, broadly speaking. This requires looking at alignment of our methods with the state of the project or intervention we're studying. So ensuring that we're documenting whether this is an efficacy or an effectiveness trial, or maybe both. It requires documenting and understanding the state of equipoise around the intervention, as well as the state of scarcity of resources, which both may inform the withholding of treatment for the study. In addition, it requires assessing alignment of methods with intervention details and any threats to an identification strategy that may occur over time, which ultimately then can affect the social value and benefit of the study. Finally, the research team documents the protocols in place to ensure high quality data whether we're collecting our own data or relying on secondary or administrative data sources. The seventh requirement is to ensure fair participant selection. This requires alignment of the research participant selection with the intervention selection criteria, or at least an explanation of any deviation from that. It also includes the research team's assessment of how the study is ensuring fairness to the control group. Since control groups bear the burden of the research, but not necessarily the benefits of the intervention studied, it's important for us to consider how control groups may be prioritized for scale up if that's feasible following the study. And lastly, this requires the research team to assess proper and appropriate payments to participants for either reimbursement or compensation of their time in lengthy surveys, or at least a documentation and justification of why a research participant payment isn't required. The eighth requirement is to ensure informed consent and protection of confidentiality. This requires a focus not only on the consent process, but also on understanding any disclosure risks and mitigation efforts required during data collection, storage, and sharing to ensure that we are in alignment with protection of confidentiality and those promises we made during the informed consent process. The ninth requirement is to ensure favorable risk benefit ratio and accountability for that ratio. This requires looking at the risk benefit ratios for research staff, field staff, research participants, and bystanders. So assessing are the potential risks and harms to these groups mitigated or balanced by the expected benefits. The last requirement is to ensure favorable cost benefit ratio and accountability. This requires the research team to compare the costs of the proposed methods against other methods so we are balancing the costs we are investing in our research with the expected benefits. We also want to compare the cost of the research to the investment dollars themselves. This brings us back to why we're doing what we're doing. There are large investments in interventions and policies where we may not have evidence of their impact. And so we wanna put the cost of the research relative to the cost of the interventions or policies that we're studying. So what have we learned so far from our pilot within 3IE? Well, it's been short and sweet. Um, and certainly a small scale version of what we're talking about. Um, but so far, what we've learned is 
A supportive peer review function can be a very useful complement to an existing tree policy and existing IRB review. The independent reviewers could identify new issues the research team had not yet considered, and the process did allow the team to recognize that they needed to document decisions they'd already made but hadn't been documented yet. The, the tree review questionnaire also provided an accountability mechanism for ensuring that we kind of record and understand research team member roles and responsibilities and how that aligns with authorship or not. It also allowed for a documentation of the various and often complex roles and relationships across funders, researchers, implementing partners, and research participants. It also called attention to the need for standards. So we are left asking a lot more questions than we have answers, but how much burden is too much burden for a research participant to not receive a payment? We don't really see a lot out in the literature about this, um, and we don't really see any guidance from the IRBs on this point either. Surveys are often one and a half or more in hours in time. Uh, and so we need to think more carefully about at what point the burden is so high that we do need to consider research participant payment. What are data collection labor standards? So definitely in the context of COVID-19 as well, how do research teams assess labor rates, work hours, work days, protocols in place to protect the health and safety of research teams? So how are we ensuring that we're working with partners that ensure fair labor, labor practices? So there's more to come, uh, but the next steps for us are to keep testing and learning this process within 3IE and to connect with others in the research ethics network. There are certainly good groups that are being started around these topics that are really important and I think pushing us in important areas. If anyone's interested in learning more about the process, we're definitely going to be publishing you know, a, a concept paper and the questionnaire in the next month or so. We're just not there yet, but if you're interested to see the draft, happy to share it. And also just to ask everyone to be on the lookout for our research ethics blog series that we've launched this week uh, to look at topics uh, in research ethics that we're tackling that especially look at the intersecting lens of transparency, reproducibility, and ethics. And we'll be launching a call for papers in the Journal of Development Effectiveness around these topics. So thanks for your time. And hopefully I didn't go over time. Thanks, Jen. That was great. Very thought provoking. I think uh, we already have a lot of discussion going on in the chat. Um, okay. I just wanted to uh, highlight one question from Alicia, uh, who's asking, our institution has a huge problem of wanting to look to the IRB as the ultimate ethical decision makers. Key question here, how do we start to chip away at this attitude and offer alternative approaches? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's where we are. Um, I mean, I know that there are others, you know, I, I think that there's two kind of efforts to think about, you know, what needs to happen within an IRB in order for an IRB to be more effective and evolve their practices around what they're examining research protocols and practices for. So what mm -hmm. actually happens within IRB review? And until I think that gets more comprehensive, I think setting up, you know, a parallel system like this is something that's important for institutions, you know, research organizations to kind of fill that gap. Um, and I think it just comes back to that first point that I highlighted from Fitz Summer Institute 2015, which is you can't, you know, as a research organization, outsource your ethical judgments to uh, a body that also isn't very transparent, <laughs> and not a very transparent process. Thank you. Um... I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Does anyone want to jump in? I see a raised hand by Takehito. Takehito, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much for the presentation. I was wondering, this topic, ethics is very important at the individual, but also disciplinary level, an international level, an institutional level. Uh, when when social scientists work together across countries or institutions, we always have to follow IRB. But the IRB standard of each institution is very different. Mm -hmm. So how could institutionally, inter-institutionally, how inter-internationally scientists should communicate each other? Should we discuss in academic society conference or should we talk to journal or what would be the effective solution from your perspective for next decade? 
Jinx. Oh my goodness. Uh, I don't <laughs> know that I have an answer for that. I mean, I think that, you know, that's the challenge that we've we've dealt with, you know, is we have we have complex research teams that are based in many different countries, you know, PIs that are based in different countries, work that is happening sometimes in multi-country studies. And and you have a huge variation in what each IRB kind of does or says or, you know, how they assess a research protocol or don't assess it, um, you know, consider it exempt. And, and there just really is this huge variation. And so I don't have an answer on how that gets tackled. But I, I do think that, you know, it's just like anything that, that an organization like BITS does, which is calls attention to it. And maybe, you know, many people working in this space can start working toward better consensus around it. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for your, uh, for your questions. And thanks obviously, Jen, for such a wonderful and informative and uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thank you, um, everyone.